Welcome back. One week after Pfizer announced promising results from its COVID-19 vaccine candidate, its rival, Moderna, now has a vaccine candidate that could be just as effective. All this coming at a critical time in the pandemic as case numbers continue to increase. Now, to walk us through what all of this means, infectious diseases specialist Dr. Zane Chagla and Dr. Susie Hoda. Uh, Dr. Chagla, maybe you can start just by explaining the basics here. So, so nearly 95% effectiveness of the Moderna vaccine. What does that actually mean? How did they arrive there? So breaking down the numbers, they took 15,000 people, gave them placebo, so gave them you know, a saline shot. They took 15,000 people and gave them the Moderna vaccine. And they followed them along to see how many of these people actually developed symptomatic COVID-19. In the group that got the placebo vaccine, 90 of them developed symptomatic COVID-19, whereas in the group that got the Moderna vaccine, five of them got symptomatic COVID-19. And so you can see there's a huge difference here between those two groups. Right. But Dr. Hoda, I, I've seen this question come up over and over again. If you're talking about, I guess, 90 plus five, like isn't 95 people a, a tiny sample size? Like why are we so sure that the end result will be anywhere close to 95 percent efficacy? I know it sounds like a very small number, but the dip, the big um, thing to focus on is a difference between those groups. So what we call it effect size, and the effect size appears to be uh, very noticeable uh, between the placebo arm and those that received the vaccine. So when there's a large effect size like that, you can say that with more confidence um, with a smaller number of people reaching that final outcome that they measured. Dr. Hoda, is, is there any reason to think that these results wouldn't hold up in the real world? Like a, a difference between the way the trials are carried out, the people on which they're carried out of? and how real life actually is. I think it's really important to know just how representative the trial participants are of the general public in the U.S. And it certainly looks like they um, tried to put in efforts to make sure that they were representing different types of groups of people uh, in terms of age range, in terms of ethnic background, uh, in terms of those that have other underlying health conditions um, to make sure that this is a little bit more sort of valid, I guess, in the real world scenario. With the numbers that we're seeing in the interim analysis, um, I'd be surprised if it deviates too far from that um, once we finalize the trial results and those are reviewed. Um, but of course, we have to wait and see what the final results are to know for sure. Right. Dr. Chagla, I, I have seen lots of questions about the length of immunity. Uh, and we get this question all the time. How long will the vaccine protect people? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's the, the million dollar question. I think we're starting to see that it is effective at a certain interval, particularly right after you get the second dose. Um, there is data from the phase one and phase two trials that show that the antibody effects last for some amount of time, you know, a few months after the initial injection. It's still unclear whether or not that translates, you know, a few months later into protection against the virus. Uh, I think, you know, most indications are from the basic science data, but again, it, there's often a, a disconnect sometimes when you jump from the basic science to the clinical trials, and that's something we'll learn as these trials continue to follow patients along. Mm. Uh, Dr. Hoda, we got th this question about sort of what exactly the vaccine is capable of. Have a listen. This is from Jamie Sire in Alberta. What is the difference between a vaccine keeping you from becoming sick and keeping you from spreading the virus further to other people. In other words, if a vaccine can keep you from falling ill, why might it not prevent you from spreading the virus further? Yeah, so it's an interesting question, right, Dr. Oda? Could you get the vaccine, maybe not get sick, but still transmit it somehow? It is possible. And so to answer that question, you have to think about what it is that we're measuring within the trials and what, what's feasible to measure. So these vaccine trials are looking at symptomatic disease developing in those that get vaccinated or the placebo. That's what the primary outcome is. Um, it's a lot harder to understand whether they could have transmitted to other people. That takes a whole other design. Um, so, you know, ultimately, we have to think about also what we want to gain with the vaccine. And if we're able to prevent symptomatic illness, and particularly severe illness, as uh, it implies with this one vaccine, I think that's what the ultimate goal is. Because even if there is a little bit of forward transmission, it's not going to result in much impact in the overall population. Right. Providing enough people uh, get vaccinated, I suppose. Uh, Dr. Chagla, Correct. what do we know about how safe 
the vaccines are and, and also in terms of side effects, what those might be? Yeah, I mean, again, a lot of this is released by press release. And so, you know, from the data set that, that was released by Moderna on their website, the, the significant or serious adverse events were fairly minimal and balanced between the placebo arm and the vaccine, which is suggestive of uh, there being no major safety side effects. I think, you know, as this is a vaccine that really does stimulate one's immune system, many of the side effects reported are ones that we associate with a robust immune response. So pain at the injection site, fever, chills, feeling a bit off for a day or two uh, are all reported with the vaccine arm. And again, that would be consistent with a vaccine that's causing an immune effect similar to other vaccines we have on the market, like the shingles vaccine or the measles vaccine. And, and Dr. Chagla, is there any reason to think that the way this vaccine provokes the immune response could be dangerous in any way? And I'm thinking of, I mean, it's sort of giving your body genetic instructions to create a part of, I mean, a protein, right, of this coronavirus? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think to use the analogy of a car, essentially it's it's giving the, the instructions on how to make a license plate. So a piece of the car that's recognizable uh, that one could, you know, identify a car with, but not necessarily enough to actually be able to drive around. So all this vaccine is doing is giving us the one piece, enough for our immune system to start turning on, but not enough to do anything else with it other than just have that one piece and, and not generate a whole virus in that sense. Well, hey, uh, we have to leave it there, but Dr. Hoda, Dr. Chagler, this has been uh, wonderfully informative. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. All the best.